Hi, welcome back to my ESG exam channel. Today I'll start chapter 3. But then before I actually start chapter 3 today, could we have a look at the tablet that I've got on hand? Yeah, like this. Well, these are topics that we discussed uh, in last episode, that's on chapter 2. So can you remember many of these topics or have you already forgotten many of those? If you've already forgotten many of those, then I suggest you go back to chapter 2 before continuing with this episode. So I assume that you're ready. Then we'll start. But then because this topic is very long, so I'll split this chapter into two episodes. So I've got, well, I've got uh, episode 1 at this time and then episode 2 uh, for the rest of the chapter. As I've just said, because chapter 3 is very long, I'm going to divide the chapter into part 1 and part 2. So um, in this episode, that's part 1, I'm going to go through, go through the first following outcomes and then uh, leave the remaining 4 to part 2 of this chapter. Uh, the first two learn outcomes are to explain the key concepts, so I'm going to go through one by one. Um, the first two main concepts will be climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Um, well, climate change mitigation, well, that's why office, that is where we try to do things well, that was kind of say slow down uh, global warming. So uh, the actions that reduce the active warming of the earth that is caused by human actions. Um, so. The objectives will be to avoid dangerous interference with the climate system, uh, to stabilize greenhouse gas levels in a time frame, to allow ecosystem to adopt naturally to climate change. Uh, so it doesn't mean that well, with climate change mitigation, then global warming will stop, but then uh, global warming is likely to uh, occur in a more controlled way, so that the ecosystem will be able to adapt uh, to this kind of change in, in, in global temperature. And the other two objectives of the climate change mitigation will be that you, it's going to ensure that food production is not threatened and then uh, it will enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. And then climate change adaptation, uh, the actions that are taken to adopt human practices to function better in a warming world and uh, thereby increasing society's resilience to climate change and reduce vulnerability to its harmful effects and as I've just said uh, even with mitigation um, adaptation is still necessary because well uh, global warming is going to happen but then in a more controlled manner so there are a few uh, things that may be uh, classified as uh, adaptation measures like protecting close lines uh, flood defenses, uh, managing land use, um, planting more efficiently for scarce water resources, uh, drought resilient crops, uh, energy public infrastructure, and uh, to develop uh, clean cooling systems. Uh, the last term, they need to uh, so called resilience measures. I have to say that although it's in the learning outcome, well, it's actually not very clear to, to define. Um, According to the notes, it says that they are the measures um, they are able to function even though the climate is changing. So way they are pretty much well the same as climate change adaptation. And if you look at it in the internet, it looks like the terms are more or less similar. But one concept that we need to understand is that um, the traditional approach to value future losses that we use discount rate uh, to discount future cash flow to now uh, may well be inappropriate to quantify the losses from climate change um, because well using this approach uh, the impact may appear to be very small because uh, of the discount rate say after discounting over a, a long period they will become very small and then 
equipment ignores the high security of such a climate event, so we probably should not need a low discount rate, especially uh, to more or less take into account uh, the severe impact on the lives and welfare of future generations. And moreover, the traditional present value approach may well ignore sharp discontinuities and tipping points, uh, beyond which damage are reversible. For example, if the temperature rises fast enough, then there will be a, a number of uh, nasty effects like Seathorn, the Primal Falls, disintegration of West Antarctic ice sheet, WMS Amazon right forest and melted green Greenland ice cap. Yeah. If some of this happen and if the temperature goes down then these changes are unlikely to be reversed. So that's why they're called tipping points and then if you just use the present very approach then uh, you're not going to be able to understand uh, the impact of these continuities which are very severe and then uh, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change there are a few things uh, that are noted the first thing is well um, human activities have caused approximately 1 to 1.1 degree Celsius of global warming above pre-industrial levels and that's likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040 even under the very low emission scenario and hopefully still remember uh, once you have studied that under Paris Agreement um, the intention is to limit the rise to 2 degrees Celsius by 2100 and make every effort to limit that to 1.5 degrees and if we succeed in keeping the rise to one and a half that could reduce the so-called climate related risk to health livelihoods for safe security water supply human security and economic growth okay the second learning outcome uh, explain key concept related to other environmental issues of increased pressure on natural resources the natural resources will work obviously include fresh water uh, loss of biodiversity and uh, land source of forestry and then um, notably um, two-thirds of the deforestation is caused by commodity production and natural resources will also include marine resources and then one of the problems on marine resources will be the threat of overfishing and he also introduced the term of blue economy and uh, blue economy is the sustainable use of ocean resources right, there are a number of terms that well maybe you, you are aware even without I say NOx like pollution uh, waste and what waste management there will be issues like say lack of landfill space uh, single use plastic effectiveness of recycling and circular economy that's based really on recycling uh, which to avoid waste and then to preserve the value of resources for as long as possible so there will be a few uh, things about circular economy including say design, say design out waste and pollution key products and materials in use which generate natural systems and by uh, via circular economy uh, maybe this somewhat possible to decouple economic activities from resource usage so that pretty much means that say um, if materials can be recycled then um, an increase in activities will not mean uh, a corresponding increase in use of uh, materials but then um, there's one problem in there is that uh, that may be offset by increased consumption uh, due to relative improvements in efficiency <coughs> okay there are a few other uh, concepts under learn outcome 3 
uh, the risk of financial stump, well, there are two main types of risk. Uh, say physical risk, well, that's quite obvious. Say for example, for more frequent severe weather events. Well, transition risk, um, transition is pretty much uh, something that we do in order to uh, transition towards a low carbon economy. But then by doing so, there are a number of risks, like say policy risks. Um, say when we transition to this kind of economy, the likelihood increase emission regulation and environmental standards. Uh, legal risk, like say lawsuits claiming damages from entities believed to be liable for their contribution to climate change. Yeah. And then technology risk, like say low carbon innovation disrupting established industries. Like for example, say if a car maker wants to start uh, uh, making electric vehicles, then it's possible that the existing uh, production lines or supply chains um, that are built around uh, the, the internal combustion engine cars may become obsolete or irrelevant. Uh, business impact on biodiversity resources there is direct impact and also uh, indirect impact. Uh, direct impact there are say, a few things like uh, land degradation, uh, use of surface water, and release of toxic materials, and then noise and light pollution. And then indirect impact that is mainly via the uh, supply chains and kind of more difficult uh, to predict and manage. And there are the possible indirect impacts. So one of the examples mentioned notice is that if there's a new road to uh, move goods, so if workers want to migrate, so if there's a new road, then workers may migrate via a new road from one place to another. And there may also be commercial development along the road. Um, Sectors relying significantly on natural resources and ecosystem services. Well, I think these are um, relatively obvious, so I'm not going to go through this one by one. And then, well, um, the last bullet, um, I'm not sure whether well, I, everyone well, knows about open cell power plants. That pretty much means uh, the power plants, uh, they'll emit uh, hot gas, gas and exhaust gas to the atmosphere. So that is uh, in comparison with so-called closed cycle or combined cell power plants, that is where the, the hot gas will be uh, uh, recycled and reused within the, the power plant. So they will not be emitted. Right, uh, supply operational and resource management issues. Um, there are a number of stakeholders in in these. Well, I said the companies they need to measure, manage, and disclose the environmental impact from their direct operations. And then, well, we are actually going to uh, see in the next few slides. Then, increasing their regulations, especially in the European Union, which we would would uh, lay down rules as to uh, what extent and in, which, in what kind of detail that comes we need to uh, disclose and for the investors investors will need to assess the extent to which companies understand the impact of the operations and manage resources that are material to their business and failure to address these challenges will expose business to additional risks but then on the other hand uh, Working on the solution present opportunity to develop a common resilient business strategy. So pretty much there are challenges, but there are also uh, opportunities. Right, the next concept, I'll show you the last concept under learning outcome number three is supply chain transparency and traceability. So supply chain sustainability, sustainability is pretty much well, the management ESG impacts and practice beyond the factory case. 
uh, in particular by looking at the source of raw materials and, and components. Um, well, this chapter is about environmental impact, so uh, we obviously want to relate this to, uh, say, emission change or climate impact. But then, um, addressing emission industry and the food system is challenging. Like say in the in industry, uh, material demand will grow, and it's possible that uh, adoption of re renewable electricity is slow, and any improvement in processes that will lead to uh, say lower carbon emission will be incremental. And to adjust emission in, in the first system is probably even more challenging. For example, uh, the require changing in food consumption habits. For example, say eat a lot less meat and eat much more vegetables, and also the change of food production habits, and by decarbonizing the supply chains. And traceability. Uh, that can ensure the reliability of sustainability claims in the areas of human rights, labor environment, and anti-corruption. Right, number four is to assess how microsoft influence in environmental factors. So, um, I'll say that this is also an important part in the sense that, well, there are lots of uh, policy that are being talked about. Although, well, uh, if you re hopefully you can recall that, well, some of the policies that are, or say, regulation that I mentioned here, uh, I've also mentioned in the previous two chapters. So, okay. Like the first one is the so called UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And, uh, well, there are the famous agreements like, say, Kyoto Protocol. Of protocols to this treaty, and this UNFCCC is still overarching international treaty related, related on climate change, and then is also responsible for the so called COP uh, conference of the parties. There are a number of well, important COPs, like the COP 11 Kyoto Protocol, which sets targets for emissions uh, of the main greenhouse gases. Well, um, it kind of stands out in a sense that uh, the targets of Kyoto Protocol are legally binding for developed countries, although um, there's no US participation. And then, well, the targets were initially set um, to end in 2012, but then extend to 2020. Well, then the other important COP is a COP21. Uh, where the so-called Paris Agreement, uh, which to keep global average temperature well below 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 Fahrenheit, but both pre industrial level and limit increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but then, um, different from Kyoto Protocol, um, the targets are so called nationally defined contributions and they are not legally binding. Uh, the scope of this agreement uh, covers both developed and developing countries and the country will need to update commitments every five years I say uh, greenhouse gas to reduce by 25 to 30 percent by 2030 and then the last uh, uh, um, most important COP the COP26 uh, in Glasgow uh, two years ago, in, in 2021. Um, there's a committee of face down the use of unabated coal power. It also recognizes shorter term emission pathways, for example, say uh, less 50% by 2030 and then less zero around 2050. Um, the commitments are via uh, so called Again, the natural de naturally determined contributions and also uh, include longer term unilateral and multilateral commitments. And hopefully, still uh, remember this for UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 goals, and then there are six of them, and uh, both 
cited by corporate investment factors like say number seven affordable and clean energy number 11 sustainable cities and community communities number 12 responsible consumption and production number 13 climate action number 14 life below water and number 15 life on land mm, EU taxonomy well we also came across uh, in chapter 2 so I'm not going to go through this so and then well the details below I said the same uh, as those mentioned under chapter 2 so um, pretty much there are 6 of that that they will uh, uh, deem an economic activity uh, environmentally sustainable and then um, the economic activity um, apart from uh, contributing to these objectives must not be doing significant harm to any of the other environmental objectives um, sustainable finance is cost regulation we also touched on very briefly last time in chapter 2 um, it's all a new piece of regulation and the intention to provide more transparency around a few things like say how the impact of sustainab sustainability risk on financial products are being systemic systemically assessed and secondly how asset managers consider and seek to address uh, the potentially negative implications of investment activities on sustainability factors and there's also a categorization system for products that may be labeled with an explicitly with an explicit ESG factors Right, um, for those who are without any kind of labeling, then they will call, be called uh, Article 6 products. And then for products claim to promote environmental and social characteristics, they are the Article 8 products. And for those with sustainable investment objective, they are called Article 9 products. And then there are other uh, policy or directive initiatives. And what is the so called uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive? That's a CSRD. Um, replaces and strengthens the existing EU requirements around non financial reporting, which covers all large companies and all EU listed companies. And more importantly, um, under this CSRD, it requires an assessment of double materiality. I hope you still remember what it is. Well, this mentioned in chapter one. Um, another initiative uh, is about the climate benchmarks in EU, like the Paris Alliance benchmarks and also climate transition benchmarks. Yeah, so other country level initiatives. Well, I'm not well. I'm not going to state every one of them, but then maybe uh, two more important ones is uh, the pension schemes act in the uk which says the pension schemes must consider steps that might be taken for the purpose of achieving the paris agreement goal and then the us scc has also unveiled proposal on the climate disclosure including climate risk governance impact and greenhouse gas emissions and targets goals and transition plans ECFD, um, yeah, we also came across this term in earlier, and hopefully you, you still know there are a number of reportable elements like say, governance, facility risk management, metrics and targets, and disclosure. We need to report on both physical and transition risks. And so, introduce the climate scenario analysis. Um, the guidelines in TCFD are voluntary, but then uh, a number of say jurisdictional countries like UK, EU and uh, New Zealand have already announced policies requiring TCFD aligned disclosures uh, and that's the so-called network for greening the financial system um, the network includes over 70 central banks and financial supervisors uh, it has developed technical guidance including uh, climate scenarios for regulatory supervision yeah, it's also introduced climate stress test.
by the last one of this episode is about, about carbon pricing um, carbon pricing is to, is to kind of implement the so-called polluter based principle and then there are two main types which includes the emission trading system and carbon taxes well emission trading system well it's pretty much say um, say there may be a company that emits a lot of uh, carbon and then there's another one or another entity um, that doesn't need much so there's a, a emission trading system come to buy common credit from one to another so in theory um, it creates an economic incentive for emission reductions to occur at the point of least cost but then um, if such trades are too restrictive then it may actually encourage uh, say the company meters to kind of shop around and do business in the jurisdiction with uh, fuel constraints and otherwise well the, the emission prices may be so low or so long emission units may be too cheap to properly incentivize decarbonization uh, carbon tax taxes or maybe so-called carbon pricing um, that sets an explicit price for greenhouse gas emissions and obviously the price level is a key determinant of success and unfortunately current actual prices are far below those required to achieve the goals of Paris Agreement and well, despite maybe certain shortcomings well, they're still uh, used in decision making for several companies and governments may also use that for in procurement policy design and policy assessments and financial institutions may use internal carbon pricing to assess their project portfolio and lastly there's so-called carbon offsetting so as to offset uh, carbon emission with the activity providing emission reduction for example say uh, uh, planting trees but then implementation can actually be quite tricky uh, 